reactions over here. And these are very important from an uh, energy point of view, from uh, a political point of view, you could say, geopolitics, whatever, historical point of view. Uh, you should appreciate these reactions. And by reactions, you're already, I think, familiar enough to know that we're talking about converting one material into another. Okay, so either we're interested in that new material or we're interested in the energy that comes out of that reaction. And I think this is the real uh, neat thing about chemistry. You're changing things fundamentally, right? The essence of change. It's also the essence of industry and economy as well. You're taking something cheap and making something valuable that you can sell. So everything really comes down to this, your control over chemical reactivity, what you can produce. So, you know, <laughs> as you're focused on those few reactions you've got to learn in chapters seven and eight, take a step back once in a while and appreciate what's going on here, okay? <laughs> Creating new things, the essence of creation, you can say. Hydrocarbons, we saw this before. Uh, they burn, right? Combined with oxygen to make CO2 and, uh, and water and the energy, tremendous amount of heat. And we'll see how much heat is generated there. Very exothermic reaction, you know, and why does it work? Well, the energies in these bonds, the change in enthalpy is uh, favorable, highly negative. And plus, these are uh, gas molecules, so the entropy change is favorable. It's becoming more random. So we'll see that these are hundreds of kilocalories per mole coming out of these reactions. You're familiar with like octane, right, gasoline or, or diesel fuel or any of the other fuels, natural gas. There you go. Um, a little side note here, these aren't always clean. So instead of just carbon dioxide, sometimes we get carbon monoxide. And depending on where you get the hydrocarbon source, if there's nitrogen or sulfur in there, you can get uh, nitrogen oxides or sulfur oxides, and these can be a problem. These are pollutant materials, right? And so uh, in cars, we have a special device, right? The catalytic converter, which in the presence of more oxygen, it's a rhodium catalyst, very expensive metal, by the way. <laughs> that catalytic converter has to work very well. To convert these partially oxidized materials, which are toxic, uh, back to the fully oxidized form, CO2, okay? Uh, so, yeah, energy and, and some solutions there with that. So it's really another secondary reaction that deals with the, uh, the pollution there. And then we have cellulose, which are the plant fibers, the woody fibers in plants and, and naturally materials. That's not food. We can't digest cellulose. It's roughage in our diet which is actually a beneficial thing. That's why you should eat your fruits and vegetables. <laughs> but we'd like to be able to convert cellulose cleanly into glucose because cellulose is just polyglucose, okay? Uh, when we do that with strong acid catalysts, uh, we, we generate a lot of byproducts. If you've lived in the Midwest and been by a sugar refinery, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, sugar beets or sugar cane is converted into uh, glucose. Mainly that's the starch part, but uh, a lot of the cellulose, the woody fibers, are just wasted in the plant. Okay, so that's just burned off or whatever. We'd like to uh, recoup all the glucose coming out of the plant, including the cellulose fibers, and convert that with higher efficiency here. So if you can come up with better cat catalysts or better processes for this, you can become a millionaire or billionaire <laughs> quite quickly, okay? A lot of people are working on this. New catalysts right here. You think it's a simple problem, but it's actually not, okay? And then when we get to glucose, we can uh, digest that with yeast. Fermentation process produces uh, ethanol, which can go into regular combustion engines and a lot of fuels you'll see at the uh, gas pump are blended with ethanol, especially in the Midwest and in Brazil. Brazil, I think, has some some vehicles that work on up to 85% ethanol. Any Brazilian missionaries out there maybe remember? <laughs> okay, usually there's, there's some there, but uh, th this becomes an efficient fuel there. But we'd like to be able to convert that easily from glucose uh, into ethanol and other materials uh, quite readily and not have to use yeast, okay? There are other renewable sources that we can talk about, uh, biodiesel, from plant oils, maybe you've heard about that. And we'll see that later when we talk about esters. But these are known reactions that are very famous. They're done on a very large scale worldwide to, to meet energy demands, right? 
So very important process. Here's some famous reactions we'd like to be able to have. And certainly if you master reactions like this, you'll certainly uh, become a millionaire probably <laughs> or win a Nobel Prize. Okay, these are uh, reactions we need, we need uh, but aren't very efficient yet. Can we take CO2, especially just right out of the atmosphere, which is low concentration, and convert that back to something like methane? Okay, because then methane, we can burn that, right? We can use that as a fuel. And that would be a renewable fuel that would not be based on a fossil fuel, but coming out of the air, CO2. But that's a tough reaction, right? That's a reduction. This is the most stable form of, of carbon, the oxidized form. So this is an uphill or an endothermic process, unless we link it to something else or provide energy, say light, for example, okay? or heat. So we could convert that back, couple it to some other reaction, and make something that's unfavorable bond-wise compared to the starting material. Okay, But you can see the challenge there, right? CO2 being the most stable form, that, that's, that's a, a problem. And then how about this? How about taking a hydrocarbon like uh, propane and converting it to propyl alcohol and putting that alcohol on this in position and not on that position? <laughs> So being able to functionalize, functionalize carbon-hydrogen bonds that are normally quite stable, we don't have any good reactions. We know some reactions that will activate alkane carbon-hydrogen bonds, but the selectivity and the yields are still very poor. We'd like to be able to do that kind of stuff, okay? So again, a couple Nobel Prize reactions here for the off. <laughs> All right, let's get back to reality here, maybe. Uh, let's look at uh, the outline here for chapter six and what we need to know. Yeah, we'll learn about uh, reactions in general. We'll look at the details, how we draw them, the equations and the components of the equations. Types of reactions, there are three, I think. Yes, yeah, substitution, elimination, addition. You need to recognize those now, what those are. You probably talked about that in Gen Chem, but I'll show you with organic reactions and gives you a little heads up on ones that we'll be looking at there. So here's a two-step reaction that involves, what, ionization first, <laughs> and then bromide attacking there. So you can already kind of see how the electron pushing might go what the mechanism might be. That's the next uh, step, right? So we've already studied structure extensively, right? The next thing is reactivity, putting the molecules in motion, converting to something else. And then the third level understanding is what the details of that reaction, and that's tracking all the electrons and atoms and pushing those electrons appropriately, okay? Uh, how do they work? Well, we break bonds, we make bonds, okay? And we have intermediates oftentimes. Not always, but a lot of intermediates. And this is another reason why carbon is so versatile and so useful. Uh, there's a wide variety of intermediates that can be accessed through carbon, okay? We can make carbocations. Now, these are high energy, unstable things. Why? Octets violated, right? And a plus charge there, okay? The carbanion, a negative charge, well, it has the octet of electrons there. But again, that's a high energy species, very basic, okay? And a radical, what do we mean by radical? We're not talking about politics here. <laughs> We're talking about an odd electron species. So it's actually seven electrons here. It's neutral, which is the unique thing here. These first two intermediates that are common are what? Ionic, right? cation and anion. Now we have a neutral thing called a radical. We'll see that in chapter 15 coming up. They're less common than anions or cations. Those are more common ones. And then we have a real weird one here, a carbene. What is that? A lone pair on carbon with two bonds? Yeah, count up your formal charge here. It is neutral also, okay? This is you know, thought of as the lower oxidation state, the lower valency of carbon. And indeed, uh, carbenes can be intermediates. They're typically associated with metals and they're very high energy reactive things because what? They don't have the octet of electrons here. We'll look at the details of bond strengths through bond association energies, BDEs. We'll have some tables we can look at there. Uh, if we're breaking bonds, that's an endothermic process. If we're making bonds, bringing together reactive intermediates to, to create the products or stable intermediate, that's exothermic. So, yeah, you should be familiar with endothermic, exothermic before, talking about the, uh, the change in the bond energies, delta H. Okay. Uh, all reactions are a function of free energy. 
which is a combination of enthalpy and entropy, energy and bonds, and then the randomness. We've already mentioned some of that. We'll review that uh, a little bit here with the uh, with the equilibrium expression, the K here, and that relates uh, through the uh, log rhythmic function to the free energy here. Okay. Uh, then we'll do some energy diagrams, some simple mechanisms. We'll talk about the kinetics, which is the barrier, the activation energy between the two. And that's the only thing that matters there. It's different than the free energy. That's the thermodynamics, the overall heat of the reaction. Those are independent normally. And then the kinetics is the barrier, how high the barrier is between. We'll talk about what catalysis can do and some little bit about enzymes there. Maybe let's do the demos right away so I'm not rushed at the end here. Let's show you what catalysts can do. So speaking of energy diagrams, you know, we've got this thing where the reaction progresses here and the energy here. And here's our starting materials and here's our products, okay? So this is a, what, an exothermic reaction because this change in energy right here is negative. We're going to a lower energy point, more stable. So that's the thermodynamics right here, okay? The delta G, whatever. Uh, that's independent of this right here. What do we call this, this double dagger thing? Should remember that from Gen Chem too, on the reaction pathway. What is this point up here, this hill, whatever? What do we call that, the transition state, right? Depending on how high this transition state is, either higher, that would be slower. And what are we talking about here? The kinetics or the speed of the reaction, right? The rate of the reaction. If this is a lower barrier here, it's faster, right? So the, the fundamentals of it are, are pretty clear there. What does a catalyst do? Let's see, does a catalyst change the, the free energy here, the thermodynamics? Or does a catalyst impact what the kinetics of a reaction? What do you say? Should remember a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. Can a catalyst raise the starting energy here on the left side? Someone's asking. Ah. So a catalyst might bring down the transition state. It might provide a different path that's lower overall. So this would be how a catalyst would work. And notice the catalyst has no effect on the free energy overall. You just get to equilibrium or you get to your end product faster. So here's an example of that. Uh, this is peroxide in the presence of soap. And the soap's in there just a little bit with the peroxide. I'm gonna add the catalyst, which is potassium triiodide. <laughs> And don't worry, there's no boom or anything, but <laughs> you'll see it faster. Peroxide is an unstable molecule. It has an oxygen-oxygen bond. We'll get to that with bond association energies. But you can decompose the peroxide very quickly with the catalyst. So peroxide's fine on its own right now. It's not doing anything. The barrier is really high without the catalyst there. Okay. It will dissipate. If peroxide sits around long enough, it dissipates. But it's slow. But if you have the catalyst here, you have a new barrier there, and hopefully it'll go fast. Work your magic there. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> See a reaction going on. That's the water that's formed by the peroxide mixing quickly with the soap. <laughs> and we get the uh, effect there. Okay. Very good. Maybe at 8 in the morning, that's not too impressive. But <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, maybe it is. A few people woke up. That's good. All right, I like this one too. This is called the oscillating clock reaction. This involves a couple metals, a different oxidation states. Oh, danger, warning. I probably should have gloves on, sorry. Also involves peroxide. So it's three components to this. Let me get about a third of that solution in there. I hope you can see this well against a white background maybe. Solution B. I like how they label these things for us, because even dumb professors can do this. Then. <laughs> if you add them in the right order, let's see. I don't know. And the component C here. Uh, the first color change, there's a couple different dyes in there, too, depending on the concentration of the metals as the peroxide works on the oxidation state of the metal. It's blue right now. And it should change back to yellow. Oops. Get a blank paper. Yep. 
Yeah. Hopefully you can see that behind a. So I went back to blue. With a little bit of time, the concentration chain goes back to yellow. Should go back to blue, dark yellow, back to blue. Yeah, kind of a Harry Potter type reaction, I think. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the details of that, but it involves a dye molecule. And the kinetics of the reaction, you see the timing, you know, that, that's linked to the concentrations. And I did mix it correctly, I think. It, it is working, right? Okay. <laughs> So hopefully that shows up on the video. Okay, but yeah, back to yellow. It'll cycle for quite a few more times. Eventually the peroxide dissipates completely, but there's a timing event there, right? The rates of the reactions are a little bit different. And like I said, it's a complicated reaction. There are multiple things happening in there. So this is not typical of a lot of reactions uh, we look at, but, but anyway, it's kind of fun. Okay, good, we got those in. <laughs> Let's get back to some other stuff we need to know here. And I like to give a heads up here on reactions that are coming up in chapters, what, seven and eight before exam two. So these reactions uh, are practical things we're going to be looking at. So here's uh, what we're going to call a leaving group, okay? So this group's going to depart. We're going to do a substitution reaction here with a nucleophile. And a nucleophile has to have at least a pair of electrons. A lot of times it's charged, sometimes it's neutral here. And what we'll get is the nucleophile now is on the organic framework, the organic substrate, whatever, and the leaving group has departed, okay? Now, if we do this type of reaction with a primary or a secondary substrate, notice right here I had a tert butyl leaving group, okay? So remember those fragments. <laughs> and I like to emphasize this right off the bat because there are differences to these reactions depending on what type of a leaving group it is. This one we call what? A tertiary leaving group. This one would be primary, okay? Because that carbon here that has the leaving group only has one carbon on it, okay? This one here, isopropyl, what is a secondary leaving group, okay? And so, yeah, these can go and these reactions here are fine. But the rate of these reactions with the primary and secondary will equal some rate constant K times the concentration of the starting material in molarity times the concentration of the nucleophile. We'll call these bimolecular reactions, okay? And this will be a typical SN2 type reaction, substitution nucleophilic bimolecular. This rate constant has to do with the speed of the reaction and notice the speed of the reaction depends on both the starting material and the reagent, the nucleophile. Okay. And that says something fundamental about the mechanism that we'll have to get to. Now, if you do this reaction with the tertiary, though, the rate here is proportional through some rate constant to just the starting material, just the tert-butyl leaving group. It does not involve the concentration of the nucleophile if it's tertiary. <laughs> so there's a change in the mechanism then, okay? So these simple substitution reactions, even though they're simple and we'll be able to see, you know, what type of nucleophiles we're talking about, <clears throat> what type of products we can get. Now here's another twist here. If we have a reagent that's considered to be a strong base, okay, with at least one lone pair and charged, normally strong bases are charged. We don't get a substitution reaction. With the tert-butyl, we'll get an elimination reaction here, okay? So the top two are substitutions. This bottom one's an elimination here. And, you know, we'll have to see what this is. If this is a strong enough base, if it's conjugate acid, has a high pKa, for example, that means the base is going to, the, the, the conjugate acid would be very weak. And then the base would be very strong, okay? So we're going to combine these ideas of acid-base strengths uh, with how nucleophilic a reagent can be to either do a substitution. But, you know, there's a couple things going on here. So the uh, mechanism is variable. So we'll have to examine that carefully. So we're looking at reactions. That's the second level of understanding in OCHEM. But this merges with the mechanism now, okay? We're going to show you a variety of reactions where that can be uh, very important. Now, why do we need to know the mechanism and the reactions? Well, you can already see here, 
to understand this variability here, we need to know something about the mechanism, how the electrons are going, and what are the factors that affect substitution versus elimination. But also beyond that, once we understand a reaction fully, what can we do? We can make variations to that reaction. We can create new products. We can do different things. We have complete control of a reaction. And this isn't just reactions in a beaker. We can understand how catalysts work, enzymes work, how different substrates biologically work, how drugs work, how they function. We can create new materials that way. So our level of understanding here impacts a number of things. Now, I should say something of a practical sense for this course. We fully expect that most of you, we could say all of you, are not going to become organic chemists. <laughs> So why are you in this class for a whole year? That was the question the first day, right? Yeah, you might remember some of these reactions later on when you're a doctor or a health professional somewhere in your career 10 years from now. Maybe you won't remember a darn thing from this class. <laughs> but if you retain some of this understanding or at least an appreciation, in fact, if you master some of this material and go on, you're in a position in whatever organization or, or company you're working for, if you know about OCHEM, you're better prepared to make fundamental contributions to those efforts, to that company, whatever. So this, this understanding will carry over uh, in a significant way for you uh, in the, this level. Even though it's going to be difficult, some of these things are going to be quite tedious. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. You're going to figure this out. Um, so how do reactions work? Mechanism. Here we mentioned mechanism. Uh, well, all mechanisms, you know, follow this thing, delta G, delta H minus T, delta S. Okay, this is the energy in what? Bonds, enthalpy. This is the randomness thing. Now, most reactions in OCHEM are in condensed phase. They're all solvated. So the change in, in entropy is not going to be significant. A lot of times we ignore that. Okay, if it's producing a lot of gas molecules at higher temperature, you can see that can dramatically favor overall a reaction, even if the enthalpy is not favored. Okay, so entropy has a has a way of creeping up on you uh, that way. All reactions so involve this: the HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital. There's at least a pair of electrons there. Fill into what? Into the LUMO. Okay which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It has to be empty. And so what do we key on here? Well, functional groups. That's why we call them functional groups. That's where the reactivity is conserved. All alcohols have similar properties in reactivity, for example. All alkenes have similar reactivity and properties. So we can focus on that. Where is the HOMO? Where is the LUMO? You can look back up here and say, well, that's probably what? A HOMO. So where's a LUMO here? Well, it might be this, what, sigma star, okay, where our nucleophile could fill in there. Oh, I'm already giving you away some of the mechanism, <laughs> okay? You already can kind of see how that nucleophile can get on there and kick off the leaving group, okay? So there's a little bit of fundamentals there, but focusing on that. And then the base strength here, we'll get into that uh, later now. Um, let's look at the typical components of a reaction. And here's what reactions always have. They have the starting material or the substrate. Okay, that's where we begin. This one has acetone going in. And then we have a reagent here, methyl magnesium bromide. Well, there's kind of a complicated one. That's a Grenier reagent. You'll learn about that in details 352, actually. <laughs> and this is a two-step reaction. We put in the Grenier reagent first. And then we put in water, okay? So it's something about over the arrow here, you know, there's a progression left to right. So this arrow has directionality. That's a reaction arrow, not an electron pushing arrow, not a resonance arrow, not an equilibrium arrow. It's just one direction, okay? Typically, Grignard reactions are not reversible. <laughs> We'll talk about reversibility too. But here's where we diagram our reaction starting material conditions involving the reagents that are involved in the reaction. Sometimes the temperature or the solvent is listed here, or even the time, how long the reaction takes. So there can be a lot of details here over the arrow. This is a two-step thing. We're quenching with water at the end, and then we draw the product or the byproduct. Byproduct in this case is magnesium hydroxide, 
Um, a lot of times there's a percent yield here, but we need to depict at least the product we're interested in here. We're not interested in that. We call it the byproduct. Oftentimes we wash that away. But uh, here's the major components of a reaction there. The kinds of reactions, what did I mention? Substitution, elimination, and addition. Okay. So we'll need to go through these three types of reactions now. I'll give you a little feel for that and draw some examples. So you should be able to recognize for a given reaction whether it's an addition, a substitution, or elimination. And you can look at this one right now and say, well, did we substitute something here? Well, we added a methyl group here. Where did it come from? Oh, it came from the methyl Grignard. Okay, <laughs> kind of see where things came from. What would you call this? Substitution, elimination, or addition? This turns out to be an addition reaction. The pi bond is gone, and we create a new sigma bond. All the elements are there from the starting materials. Okay, we didn't take anything away. Didn't eliminate anything. Did we substitute anything? No, everything's still there from the starting material. We just added some new stuff. So to get a feel for this, let's uh, go through some examples. Uh, let's do substitution first. And give you a feel for this. So how about this reaction? Now acetone's listed under the arrow because acetone is the solvent for this reaction, okay? So that can vary. Uh, this turns out to be critical for the success of this reaction. And what, we're gonna go to the product here, which is iodide. And then sodium chloride's our byproduct. And that actually is not soluble in acetone. It will precipitate out. <laughs> so sometimes we get some physical properties of a reaction. Is this a substitution reaction? What did we substitute? Yeah, we lost the chloride and we added the iodide. Now it's not an addition reaction because it's a clean substitution. Everything is still there on the substrate side and we just took one functional group off and put on a new functional group. So indeed it is a substitution uh, reaction. Um, and that, those are typical uh, where you have uh, the reactivity here is sp3 at that position, and it's still sp3. So you can kind of track hybridization to help keep track of these things. So here's another substitution, a little more complicated. First, we're going to treat with sodium hydride. That's going to take off this hydrogen here. You could do a pKa analysis here of the alcohol and hydrogen, which is a byproduct there. That'll form O minus right here. And then we're going to put in methyl bromide. Okay. And our reaction here is this. We're going to form the new methyl ether from the alcohol. So what do we substitute? We took off a hydrogen. You always have to take off something. Substitution, put something else on right there. What do we put on? We put on the methyl group. So that's clearly a, a substitution type reaction. Here's a more complicated one still. Here's benzene. We're going to react it with bromine and ferric bromide. And they're going to create bromobenzene. Now this one's a little trickier too because we don't always show all the hydrogens in a starting material. There are six hydrogens here on benzene. Look, we substitute just one of them for a bromine. Okay, so another substitution reaction. Okay, questions on substitution? And I think, you know, you'll see all the, the other two examples, what addition and elimination here, you'll get a little better feel for it. Now, elimination's a little bit different. Uh, let's have a general depiction here, X, Y. Okay, and, you know, X and Y might be a functional group or a hydrogen or whatever. And we're going to take off X and Y. And X and Y don't always end up bonded to each other, but look at that. So we eliminated what X and Y. Everything else is still there, but clearly we broke a couple bonds, pulled something off, created the alkene here. Okay, so we call that an elimination reaction. And plus we went from what? SP3 hybridized down to what? SP2, which is a hallmark. Elimination. It's a way to form uh, pi bonds, alkenes, 
or all kinds. Let's look at a specific example here. Here we have this bromide. We're going to tr treat with sodium ethoxide. The sodium ethoxide is a strong enough base to do elimination reactions. It'll do some substitution in this case, but I'll go to this plus ethanol <clears throat> plus sodium bromide. Should have that on there. Okay. So yeah, a couple byproducts there. But the alkene, you see, we're losing a hydrogen here and the bromide right there. So clearly an elimination. How about this one? So we can have an alcohol, treat it with sulfuric acid. Okay. And what do we get here? We're going to get the alkene. And water will be a byproduct. This is called a dehydration reaction. Okay, if it's strong enough acid, we can do that. But again, you see the rehybridization. You see the loss of some functional groups there. Okay, eliminations. Um, how about additions now? Let's do those. And additions, you could say, well, they're just kind of the reverse of eliminations, right? We've got an alkene. And we're going to add some reagent. And we're going to go to some new product. Okay. <laughs> so you see we went to SP2 to SP3. And the alkene's gone now. And we've added something new. Okay. We haven't taken anything away at all. Right. Substitution is a little bit tricky there because you take something off and add something on. Usually it's a clean, you know, addition of a nucleophile and then loss of a leaving group. This is a little bit different here, right, with the pi bond going away. So how about this? And that's, you know, drawing the reaction a little bit differently. I could have had the bromine, the BR2, on top of the arrow. Okay. The thing we're interested in is usually the carbon substrate. And so what does this go to? It will go to the dibromide. That's a reaction we'll see coming up very soon. Okay, bromination of alkenes. You see it as an addition. How about this one? Now we can think about this. We're going to add hydrogen and bromine from HBr, hydrobromic acid. And we're going to add it there. And this is a little bit different there because now we're thinking about, well, Let's see, I put hydrogen here on this end, and I put bromine here on that end. So we already need to be thinking about what the mechanism to figure out why I didn't put bromide there and why I put it there. Okay, So stay tuned for that. That's called regioselectivity. That will be an important issue that will come out of our mechanistic analysis. Ah, here's one. It's done on very large scale. Ethylene plus... Uh, Osmium tetroxide and water, and the product is this, ethylene glycol. Anybody know what ethylene glycol is used for? <laughs> it's another car-related thing. <laughs> it's antifreeze. It's in your uh, radiator. <laughs> has a very high melt, uh, boiling point and uh, <laughs> a, a hard, large heat capacity, too, so. Useful material in antifreeze, so ethylene glycol. But you, all you need to recognize here is, you know, here here's the reagents, here's the starting material, ethylene, and clearly an addition type reaction. Two alcohols now on there. Okay. Questions on that? Just the general types of reaction. All right. Let's look at uh, bond making and bond breaking. Let's get into the details of reactions here. Obviously, we've changed those substrates and, and done some things. Um, let's begin by looking at the mechanism. Um, mechanisms, you know, keep track of the bond breaking and the bond making process. It counts for everything, the intermediates, the, the products, the byproducts here. There are two types, concerted mechanisms. Concerted happen all at once. So let's look at this one again going to 
the iodide. Okay, we had it in acetone, whatever. So how does this work? Well, here's our nucleophile, which will be I minus, okay? <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to see within the reagents, you know, what's the nucleophile, what's the other Sodium iodide, you should ionize it that way, right? The metal is always the cation part. So how does this work? If it's concerted, look, you can attack that carbon. And why are we attacking that carbon? Well, that's partially positively charged, right? This is a polar covalent bond. So all those principles that we covered before carry over that will help your understanding here. So as the bond making is occurring here, we have the bond breaking event happening what? Simultaneously, okay? This is a bimolecular SN2 reaction that we'll learn about later on. But that would be concerted. Let's look at stepwise. Stepwise reactions uh, involve multiple intermediates, and they're a little bit harder uh, mechanistically. They keep track of some other factors here. Let's look at this one, where we react water with an alkene in the presence of sulfuric acid. And what we're going to get is the alcohol. Now, that's just the reaction written, okay? But now the mechanism I'm going to draw below which helps us figure out why this reaction works, okay? And the steps. It's known to have two intermediates. First, we protonate that alkene, and we draw what? We draw this. Oh, now what is that? That's a carbocation. You saw one of those intermediates. It has six electrons around it, plus charge right there. Uh, what happened to sulfuric acid? Well, it's now bisulfate. Okay, it's the anionic form. You can draw out the full structure there. I'm not going to spend time on it now. Just looking at the intermediate, the stepwise thing. Okay, next step. So we have more arrows down here, right? <laughs> and now what do we do? Well, the water does its thing. It attacks. It's the nucleophile for that carbocation. And what does that give us then? It gives us hydronium ion. Water still has its two hydrogens on it when it attacks, okay? It doesn't fall off at the same time. <laughs> this is a stepwise, known to be a stepwise mechanism. Two intermediates, carbocation and hydronium ion. And then what? There's another step here. How do we get to the neutral alcohol? Well, water can function as an acid or a base. Here it's functioning as what? A base, and it's grabbing that proton off, one of them, because there's two on here right now. And going to that. So mechanisms can be one step concerted like this, or they can be stepwise, okay, where we have to draw some intermediates out. But these factors and the understanding, don't worry, we'll help you out there. And don't feel like you've got to memorize <laughs> these reactions yet or anything. We'll see these in later chapters. It's just the principle right now we're focusing on. All right, more details on bond breaking. Let's see here. How do reactions work in a little more detail? Well, when we look at bond breaking, it can happen a couple different ways. Let's just look at A, B, a bond between two generic groups. So remember, a line is what? Two electrons. So there's a bond, a covalent bond between A and B there. Let's look at it first homolytically. Lytic, meaning breaking. And homo, meaning we're going to generate Similar intermediates, okay? The same type of intermediate. How can we do that? Well, we take this and put one electron on B out of that bond and one electron on A out of that bond. Why is that homolytic cleavage of that bond? Well, it generates similar species, A dot plus B dot. These are radicals, okay? They're often neutral species. In fact, more often than not, they'll be neutral. This is the bond dissociation energy we'll look at probably next time. We'll see how much time we got here. There's another way to break the bond. It's called heterolytic cleavage. And what? This generates two different type of things. And this is actually the more common way to do it. Uh, one atom is typically more electronegative than the other. So those electrons are already polarized toward B, we would say in this case, being more electronegative. And so if we do this, what's the result? A is now cationic, and B is anionic overall, okay? 
And you've seen this ionic intermediate for the stepwise thing already. That actually turns out to be more common. Radical pathways, we'll look at it from bond association energies effects. We'll also see it later on in chapter uh, 15. So if you look at a specific thing here on carbon, you know, you've got, uh, let's say, a very electronegative group like chloride. What would be the most li likely pathway here? Well, you can take that polarized bond to the extreme, right, and break that bond. And in a polar solvent, this is actually what occurs. <laughs> you can go to the carbocation then and the chloride anion. And we call that what? Heterolytic bond cleavage or bond breaking. So that's all you need to uh, know there uh, right now, I think. Uh, a couple other ways to do things. Um, yeah, maybe we'll skip that. I mean, the radical thing, we've already shown you the radical, the homolytic thing. We could show you the carbene thing, too. Maybe I'll do that uh, later. All right, let's look at uh, bond making now. So that was bond breaking. Now bond making. <laughs> they always go together. We're breaking bonds. We gotta make bonds. <laughs> it's this exchange of bonding, which is neat. That's why it's called a reaction. What's the action? Well, it's dumping things together, right? <laughs> The molecules react. Why? To go to a lower overall free energy state, reorganizing the electrons in the bonds. Okay, that's the amazing thing about chemistry overall. So what do you mean by making? So you can do it, uh, what, homolytically there. And, and we should say, you know, th this is uh, exothermic now. The, the breaking was, was endothermic. I should have mentioned that. We'll, we'll get into thermodynamics uh, next time. But So that's uh, the homolytic thing. And this, you know, is the standard, what, uh, hetero way forming the, the, the same thing here. Okay, wow, we got a lot of arrows. Just on those two depictions, I've got, what, how many types of arrows? This is a reaction arrow here going left or right, okay? This is a mechanism arrow now. There's two different types here. This is double-headed, meaning what? The motion of two electrons. And then I've got these single fishhook type arrows for what? Radicals. That's the movement of one electron. So how many arrows are we talking about here? This is almost uh, like the Hunger Games, you could say. Too many arrows flying around in OCAM. Uh, let's keep track of this. Let's review what some of these arrows mean. You know, left to right, that's a reaction arrow, okay? Uh, what about this one? We haven't seen that one yet. We'll have to look at reversible reactions, look at free energy there. Double-headed thing, meaning the starting material and the product are in flux, right? A lot of times in a practical sense, a reaction goes cleanly from left to right, depending on how exothermic it is. Okay, most reactions we'll see are, from a practical point of view, irreversible. But a lot of things we've already seen with acid-base chemistry can be reversible, so you need the double-headed arrow there. Yes. Yes. So question is, you know, are we transitioning back and forth? And yes, here the system we can add different things that are a shock to the system, and then push it either to the left or the right. So it's a dynamic system that can be changed to favor either what's written on the left or what's on the right, depending on that change. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. I'm just pointing out these differences in the arrows as they're drawn right now. What about this one? Double arrow on each side. What one's that referring to? Not a reaction now, not an irreversible or reversible reaction, right? What are we talking about here with a double-headed arrow like that? You remember that? We use that for a specific resonance structures. Very good. Thank you. And those are, you know, where we draw the different localized structures and we uh, combine all of them uh, to, to be the hybrid of the true structure, okay? So we've already talked about resonance structures and yet another type of arrow. Are we done there? No, we've got the curved arrow, which we're talking about the mechanism, which is what, two electrons? And then we've got the curved arrow, single fish hook, that's the mechanism, one electron. <laughs> 
And is there another arrow? Oh, I've drawn this one recently too on the board. <laughs> that, that arrow with a plus on the back side, what's that referring to? Not a reaction, not the mechanism. That's referring to what? Dipole. Okay, so dipole moment, uh, you know, polar covalent bonds, whatever. And that will help us in the mechanism. And then we'll be drawing things with the curved arrows. But that's a lot, right? We're arrow crazy here in our chem. <laughs> Use them uh, appropriately and hopefully uh, we can keep track of that. All right, let's look at the energy diagram again. I kind of started with this with catalysis there. And I like to emphasize this again, just to talk about some of the details we've already been discussing here in class. Here's our reaction progressing. Here's our energy going up on the other axis. And then we've got starting material. And starting here, we're really talking about the state of the reaction. When we dump those things together, it's a combination of the starting material, the reagents, the solvent, the conditions, the pressure. Actually, a lot of things go into this state that we start out at, OK? But we can think of that you know, as a certain energy point here. And then we got a barrier there, and then we go down to the product, okay? So let's identify again these different positions. So there's our free energy change, okay? Going from the starting material down to the product, and that's a combination, of course, of the energy in the bonds, delta H, and the randomness, delta S, okay? So that's the thermodynamics. We need to talk about that. Bond dissociation energies. That's what we'll use to keep track of that. There's some charts in the book. You've probably already seen that if you've read ahead. We'll have more details on that on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. There's all sorts of combinations here. Depends on, and so the question is, you know, this transition point is where bonds are being broken, okay? Uh, typically, it's an endothermic process to break the bonds, okay? So bond breaking, let's put that on the, on the left side there. And then coming down here, what, this is more bond making? Well, we saw the concerted one where they're happening at the same time, you know? And the question is, do they ever just break apart and sit there on their own? Yeah, there are examples of that. Most of the ones we'll look at cleanly go from a starting material to a product, okay? And we call that an irreversible reaction. That depends on what the barrier is going back up here, okay? And what this relative energy difference here. But this is the transition state, and that has to do with the kinetics, or the speed of the reaction, or the rate, whatever. We've already mentioned a little bit about that, and how that can vary, right? Between bimolecular and unimolecular reactions. Okay, that rate equation expression uh, can depend on the concentration of different things. So we'll have to look at that combined with the mechanism next time. So stay tuned for that. As it's drawn here, is this an exothermic or an endothermic reaction overall? Is delta G becoming more negative? Yeah. You see the energy here is lower on the diagram. So this would be for an exothermic reaction. Uh, we don't know. The speed here of the reaction, we'd have to measure it. But if we could lower that barrier, it would become faster. If there was anything that would raise that barrier, it would become slower. Okay? So you already have a lot of feel, understanding here. It's actually a three-dimensional uh, surface, energy surface, that includes a lot of factors. We're just looking at it in two dimensions here drawn on the board, which is really a simplification of it. But it lets us talk about the free energy change and the rate. So it's a useful, although oversimplified, uh, view of what a reaction is. But those factors, you know, have to do with the structure of the starting materials and the nature of the reagents. And that's, that's what we'll get into next time. Yeah, so very good. We'll end it.